Hey everybody, how's it going? Dan Schinder here on Yes Shift. And I'm Steven Schinder. And we brought with us a guest for their very first hazing, Billy Sherwood. Welcome. How are you doing? I'm good. Where'd you go? I, I've got this sign in the front of me that says, this meeting is being recorded by a host. How do I get rid of that so we oh, can enjoy it? Oh, you? I don't know, but we can see you. You're good. Okay. There, there might be something to click, but but we're good. We can see you. Okay. And if you need to futz around with that to get rid of it to see us, that's totally cool. Steve and I will kind of get us rolling here. First of all, thanks for taking time. We're very happy to have you. As you know, you and I have known each other Wow, since we were in our early 30s and now we're senior citizens, how'd that happen? I think there's a yes song about that somewhere. <laughs> I'm flying by, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and folks, if you're listening, just let us know how we sound and feel free to chime in with anything that we discuss in this interview. Yeah, a answer questions and comment on things that we touch on. I'm going to let Steve open the questioning uh, with some really cool stuff related to what you might be up to now. Yeah, so um, you've been very busy lately. And what I was curious about, because I've seen all the like different pictures and whatnot, is, uh, well, first off, how was Rosfest recently? How's the overall vibe there? Oh, it was a blast to, I mean, to get out there and play. That's the first gig I've played since August or whatever it was. We stopped in 2019. Yeah. So um, for me, it was kind of a selfish endeavor because I, I just wanted to go out and play. So um, I kind of tagged along with Dave Kersner's all-star band, which was really cool. Yeah. Like, amazing musicians and uh, kind of snuck onto the boat. You know, I was the only yes <laughs> member on the thing. The stowaway. Exactly. I kind of felt more like a tourist than a, a, an artist on that one. But um, it was a lot of fun. And, and to see everybody again, especially, you know, for the most part, mask free and just living the life again. It was just joyful and, and a great experience. Fresh you know? ocean air that you could breathe without smelling fabric in front of uh, it. I guess your question was about Rosfest, which is where that started. Oh, I, I was thinking of the cruise. Yeah, we'll get to that. Well, I, <laughs> I did, I did Rosfest with Dave, and you know, when it was done, I said to him, "Man, I just wrote charts out for twenty of your songs, and I played for about an hour and 30. I'm coming with you on the cruise. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You put that much work into it. <laughs> so, yeah, that's Rosfest was amazing. Great to see all those people from Rosfest who I, you know, I've known for a long time because Circa headlined Rosfest back in the day. I think it was 2006. And uh, the, apparently the, the legend is, is the bass is still echoing through the valley. Because oh, great. Uh, <laughs> so it was great to see everybody again and, and do that. And then, of course, as I said, you know, cruise to the edge. It was just, it's just, you know, it felt like we're back here. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, back on Earth, right? As we know it. Back to reality and people playing and interacting and shaking hands. And, you know, for a while we were told we're not going to shake hands anymore. You know, it's like, yeah. so we're sort of back to, to where we are. I mean, we're obviously all in recovery mode from what just happened. Um, everyone in their individual lives, you know, paid a bit of a price in their way. Yeah, you know, in so many ways with with health and whatnot, but also economically and and just emotionally and and you know artistically and spiritually, all that stuff tied together of just being boxed in and not free to do what we want to do. You know, definitely. So, yeah. really and we got a testimonial already in the comments. Christina Verbano Jeffrey says you guys sounded great at Rosfest, so that's great. Cool, 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 cool. Yeah, yeah. awesome. I know it's funny because. Uh, as you know, Dave Kersner is also in my band, Arc of Life, that we have. Yeah. And so at rehearsals, you know, I came in with very little time and, and got my charts together. And was really, uh, Dave was, you know, pretty, pretty brutal taskmaster at times, you know. And, <laughs> and when the rehearsals is done, I said, oh, I can't wait to get you into an Arc of Life rehearsal, man. <laughs> <laughs> Payback. About that. So, yeah, it was fun. It was good. Oh, Christina's the violinist for Lobate Scarp. I thought the name sounded familiar. We are huge fans of Lobate Scarp. We had Adam on. We played a clip of you doing vocals with Adam in the studio. That's awesome. Thanks for joining us, Christina. Yeah, that was a fun project. And uh, Adam's been a, a friend of mine for many, many, many years, you know. And uh, so, of course, when he asked me to do it, I was like, yeah, man, I'm in. So it was fun. 
Uh, I'm proud. Great. I oh, it took him a while to get it going. You know. Yeah, great, Steve. Uh, yeah, speaking of Ark of Life, I was wondering like how things are going uh, with that because like are you working on a new album and are there potential touring plans with that sometime in the future? Well, just as Ark of Life came out, the, the COVID thing was kicking into high, right. and so we everything was wiped out. So unfortunately, we had plans to go out and play live, but they just got crashed, you know. Um, and now that we're at this point and yes is re-entering the equation here and i'm also you know going to be playing with asia soon here too um it's all about getting the schedule together of where we can make that point of entry to go out and do gigs at the right time um so that's the sort of idea for the live front of arc of life we, we all want to get it going and get playing and, and, and perform with that band um but in the meantime uh, we've actually made a new record and I literally just finished it and had it mastered by more Applebaum. Oh, he's uh, great. Oh, wow. Just about, you know, maybe whatever it was three weeks ago now. So uh, now I'm just working on cover art and, and getting all the sort of stuff together with Frontiers Records to, to get it ready to come out. When they put it out, I don't know. But, um, you know, it's, it's a it's a really cool record. The first record, you know, admittedly is a little bit more straight ahead in places and a little more, you know, not that it's a bad word, but it kind of commercial. Yeah, and it's not as, bad. As the record starts, it starts that way. And then it evolves into a, a sort of more progressive feeling thing by the end. And, and this is almost like a relay race now where we took that baton and now we've just gone farther faster with it and so it's much more progressive on this one the last track is 17 minutes long it's actually called arc of life the last track uh, how'd you come was, up with that name <laughs> well the first track that john and i wrote for this when we were just writing for fun oh so we kept writing the song and kept writing and writing and eventually it was like 17 minutes long so when when it came time to sort of put together the first record i, I played music for frontiers and that was one of the songs and they they kind of were like, well, this is really cool, but we kind of were looking for more of a straight ahead kind of record here for the debut. So that song just kind of went on ice for a minute, but has since now resurfaced and, and been flushed out and, and developed and, and just sounds killer. And is that's great. It's, it's the right evolution for the band at the right time, I think. You know? Oh, well, that's great. You know, you, you mentioned a word that reminds me of a question I was thinking about earlier today I wanted to ask you. You use the word commercial, and that's not always a bad thing, but, or however, it has always related in the past to equating with radio, airplay, accessibility, that kind of thing. In 2020, whatever we're in, wh how important is radio airplay for a band now, Billy, being that you can promote yourselves online. So I, I never list, me personally, I never listen to music on the radio anymore. Me it's either. all YouTube, it's on Facebook, it's, you know, I, I get CDs sent to me. How important is radio airplay and that kind of accessibility? Is it a factor? I think, you know, any and all media and music getting out there in front of more and more people is a huge factor. Okay. It's changed in how it all works now as we all know it used to be radio and, and sitting around your radio and checking out new material as the dj told you what was coming and you were excited to hear it next week's coming the new zeppelin or whatever the case right. is but now it's you know we live in a world of, of where you know people are getting their entertainment on tiktok in five second chunks so the, the patience level of things have changed immensely so i think people have branched off into their corners and those who appreciate music uh you know as art um still are looking for and yearning for that kind of you know 50 minutes of music that takes their mind away from the troubles of the world and brings them to another place yeah and so, weirdos like Stephen and i love the physical product still you know we love to open it read through it play with it smell that new album smell even though it's you know yeah. i'm still so old school when it comes to that yeah, and, and that's the way a lot of people feel, and, and that's the core of what's really supporting that whole thing in music now. Uh, the top layer of that is commercial success in, in terms of like modern music, what are hits and whatnot, and that's still a huge factor, and the radio is massively important for, for that. Um, there's other ways that 
that you break through in terms of maybe you have a song in a film that's huge and all of a sudden everybody right. reacts to that or you get a song in grand theft auto five and people identify <laughs> yeah it's from very very different sources but you know i'm well aware of the type of musician and the type of genre that i'm in and i i'm in a, a niche sort of lane uh you know you could say that there's prog rock there's jazz there's fusion there's you know, soundscapes, there's, there's this whole subgenre of music where when it branches out, the commerciality, if you will, of needing radio play is kind of irrelevant because the fans are already there and following it and, and in it, you know what I mean? Yeah. So for, for us, it's not as mission critical as it might be for a new band trying to break where radio would certainly help, you know what right. I mean? It's, right. it's, it's it's kind of all relative to where you are on the ladder of, of your journey musically, you know? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. You know, before we continue on with some other things that are happening now and in the future, I want to, let's talk about you and your personal musical journey and, mm -hmm. and where it ends up is not mm -hmm. only the things you just mentioned that you're working on, but along that way, more recently in the last 20, whatever years, mm -hmm. You, you've worn more hats and have played more roles than any other cosmonaut in the Yes universe. You've played guitar, you've played bass, you sing, you've written, you've mixed, you've, you know, you do all these different things. So starting from, when I say starting from the beginning, you don't have to give us a week by week play, but you grew up in a musical family. You started with drums. How did all this sort of evolve and what did you gravitate towards instrumentally i know your musical influences and feel free to chime in on that too but kind of give us a bit of that evolution the, the sort of shortest version i can give you of the timeline and chronological sort of journey of how it evolved was you know my first memories of, of sitting underneath my dad's white grand piano in the living room while his dixieland jazz band was rehearsing and my mom was playing drums yeah. and when they took a break i would walk over to the drum kit and she would sit there and go, you know, two and four on the hat and roundhouse on the ride, <laughs> make sure your snare's solid. So I started playing drums, you know, because she she kind of inspired me to to do that. And so um, once I kind of had the ability to play, pardon me, I got this weird hair going on. Um, <laughs> once I had the ability to play and, and kind of hold time together, um, all of a sudden it, I took it a little more seriously and started really thinking about, well, maybe I do want to be a musician and I, I do want to go for this so I started playing my first band was a little punk band that I had and then uh, I I moved to Los Angeles where my brother's band Logic had moved to right. and were without a bass player uh, for a minute hang on a minute this hair is driving me nuts sorry <laughs> it's okay um, they had a bass player who had bailed out and at that point, Jimmy Hahn, who's a you know lifelong friend of mine, we were all living in a band house here in LA, six people in this tiny little place. And um, Jimmy says to me, you know, why don't you buy a bass, man? Start playing bass. Um, you've got the drum thing down, but it's really loud. And, and no one in the band wants you to be playing drums in the afternoon because they're all asleep. And then they're giving, <laughs> giving you grief. Buy a bass, you can play in headphones and, and get, you know, still do it. So at that point, I still I, I kind of had my drums. I, I got a bass, and I started jamming with Yes Records, pretty intensely, and Weather Report, and Emerson Lake Palmer, and, and Jim was a big part of my education, helping me to get going on that level. Once I had a kind of a grip on on it, wasn't long after that 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 Logic I had actually introduced them to another bass player, mm. this guy Jim Zeeland, who was a friend of mine in school, and he was a real solid bass player. I I didn't have the confidence that I was the guy yet. So Jim was in the band. It didn't really work out for the guys. So they're back to having no bass player. And it's at that point that they all looked at me and said, you know, just play bass. Let's go. So I jumped into Logic. And that's when we started getting really serious about things. And the guys in Toto stepped into a rehearsal, heard our band Logic, and waltzed us into A&M Records and got us a great record deal. So they had just done Toto 4 with Rosanna in Africa. They had carte blanche in LA. Wow. So those guys produced C. Picaro, David Page, Greg Ladani produced the Logic record. And we thought, you know, especially at a very young age, I think I was like 18 or 19. I, I literally was, you know, just out of high school or what 
I was going to high school when I was going to high school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we make the Logic album, and of course, we're all buying Maseratis and Porsches in our mind, but as the business teaches you if you're in it long enough man it's like there's ups there's downs there's highs there's lows so from the high of getting that band signed and making a great record and feeling really good came the downside which was we lost our record deal and the label regime change and the president was no more and this guy moved and our A&R guy was gone and you know those things happen and and so logic ended and I wasn't sure what I was doing and I ran into an old friend of mine, Bruce Gowdy, who was a great guitar player, songwriter. And he says to me, let's, let's write some songs. Just try to get a publishing deal. You know, mm. forget the record company band thing. Let's just write some. So we wrote four songs. Mm -hmm. Those four songs were the revolution song, The Moment Is Here, uh, Can't Let You Go, and Fight to Win. Those four songs, we shopped around Los Angeles and everyone passed. I mean, we were, wow. we, but we were hell bent that it was going to work. So let's just keep taking meetings. So we took meetings everywhere and everyone passed until we went to a key figure in our career, both Bruce and mine. Um, Sherry Saba was a, was a A&R sort of rep for Warner Chapel at the time publishers, friend of Bruce. Bruce said, Hey, Sherry, you should hear this music. It's kind of cool. Sherry heard it and flipped out. Really? So Sherry took it to her boss, Mike Sandoval, who was the president of Warner Chapel at the time here in L.A. And we took a meeting at the 9000 building on Sunset. So we're at the top floor in Warner Chapel and Bruce and I are looking going, hey, they not only did they not pass, but like they invited us down here. Something good must be coming. Yeah. And literally, it was like a scene from a movie because Mike Sandoval, who's a super nice guy and he, he kicks in the revolution song and he literally gets up on his chair and starts just rocking. Wow. And I'm looking at Bruce going, whoa, what's going on here? So long story short there, we got a very, very large publishing deal. So let me, I, if I could jump in, there's a huge twist in the, in the story of events here. Did the others who passed ever say why they passed? And was it clear with Sandoval, why it resonated with him? Too progressive. Mm. Oh. You know, at the time, we were How progressive was it? Was it Sound well, Chaser you know, or was it Owner you know, of the You know those songs. You know the Revolution song. And the yeah. Revolution. They leaned into a yes feeling. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, the other thing that was, was odd for me, my whole journey leading up to yes, is every band I was in, everyone said, you should be in yes. I mean, David Page from Toto, when we were tracking bass on Logic, said, dude, you should be in yes. I'm like, well, no, Chris Squire's got that gig. <laughs> it was kind of taken for a while, yeah. But Was uh, this like 84-ish, 85, yes, 83? Uh, Logic was uh, 83 to like 85, 86. Then we okay. broke up. World Trade started 86, 87, 88, somewhere in there. Okay. So long back to the, the four songs get signed as just publishing. There's no record deal there. But the yeah. publishing deal was so big for the time that it sparked the interest of every label. They're like, well, what's oh. going on? You guys gave that much money to these two guys for those four songs. We want to hear them. So now, all of a sudden, we've got labels saying, wow, we want to sign you. So now we have to do showcases. So we set up and we start playing for this label and that label and this one and that one. And we get through the entire situation until the very last showcase where a guy walks in who i had no idea he, who that he was where he was because i wasn't that tuned into the business and who the hierarchy and the power players were i was just a bass player <laughs> and so derek shulman walks into the room and oh to me, wow was, gentle what giant finger of gentle giant doing here lo and behold he's a huge power player at polydor Oh, wow, that's right. On Dovey and all these guys. And he heard World Trade and said, I'm taking it. And we that's where my relationship with David, or with Derek, started. Oh, wow. So, so we got signed to Polydor for a very, very large record deal. And we thought we were going to be taking that to the next level. And, and actually, we were, for a while, in direct competition with ABWH, who was on Arista at the time, 
and Trevor Rabin's solo album, which had just come out. Right. Can't look away. And I get record reports that were like them on top and us on the bottom. And then next week we were closer. And then we got above oh, wow. them. I was like, wow. I mean, these are my heroes and we're above them. Something good is happening here. Yeah. Just around that time, Derek calls me and says, I ha I'm leaving Polydor. I'm going to become the president of Atco Records. So he leaves Polydor, which essentially is, again, another version of what I told you about logic, regime change. Yeah. Whenever regime change, everything shifts, and you're either lucky if you survive or you're one of the ones who get booted. So I was young and kind of naive and didn't believe the end was as near as Derek was telling me it was at Polydor. I was like, no, man, we, we're, we're cooking, the band's smoking. At that time is where he, uh, he, he introduced me to Squire, who had heard the demos for World Trade. And Derek said, World Trade's pretty much done over there at Polydor, and this guy could be the lead singer of Yes, you should meet this guy. So Chris and I met, and that's where our relationship started. And we started writing material. World Trade was still in existence over on Polydor. And as that was happening, Chris said to me, it's... It, you're going to be the lead singer of yes and i keep saying no i'm not what are you talking about and he, no man this is a good thing we're going to do this i'm like no 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 no. I, i'm into working with you and, and and writing songs but i have my band world trade you know what i mean and derek would call me and go dude your band is gonna they're gonna drop you trust me i'm like no derek i've talked to dick asher it's good you know we're, we're still in so i'm sort of naively hanging on to the dream if you will and the whole time the, the lawyers the agents the managers but, oh, this is a great idea billy sure it's going to be late singer yes everyone thought it was a great idea except me i never wanted to do it and i didn't do it so just so you okay. know i gotta interject something as you're telling this i remember being at alan white's house who you remember where he lived in west hills and yeah. i grew up on the on the street behind his street okay yeah and, and so I would go to my parents. I found out he was living there. I went there, introduced myself. We became friends. I remember being at his house saying, have you ever heard of World Trade? And I said, no. And he pulled out the album and he pointed to your picture and he said, it looks like this guy's going to be working with us. Let me put this on. And he put it on and played it for me. And I was like, oh, wow, that's interesting. So I was kind of like on the sidelines watching all that unfold. And I'd, I'd see him like once a week, once every couple of weeks and he kind of update me and it was really interesting and it's interesting hearing it from you now right well at that time when it was let's say reaching its pinnacle point where the pressure was intense on me that they wanted me to jump in and and join you know it it's funny because i have i had a extremely long and great relationship with chris there were a few periods like family, like brothers, where you don't talk to each other for a little while because things get hairy and you got to sort it out. Yeah. This was one of the moments because I, I told Chris, I'm like, look, I know everyone thinks I'm going to do this, Chris, but I'm telling you, I'm not. So when you call me, don't talk about this with me. It's not going to happen. Let's just table it. Oh, yeah, yeah, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Chris in his jovial manner. <laughs> I'll talk to you tomorrow. I'll talk to you tomorrow. So, okay. So he calls me the next day what's up i'm like just working what are you up to it, this is going to be so great man. <laughs> and i'm like no, chris you don't understand i'm not doing it you know, don't i don't even want to talk about it anymore uh, seriously and I, he calls me the next time and i said to him chris i love you and i love our relationship here and how it's developing and we're writing and we're friends and everything but i swear to god if you mention this to me again i'm going to change my phone number <laughs> And he laughed really hard, like he did. Uh, I'll talk to you tomorrow. I said, okay, talk to you tomorrow. <laughs> Calls me the next day and says, hey, man, how you doing? I said, good, what are you up to? He goes, this is going to be great. I said, what's that? He goes, you know, you joining yes. I said, that's it. I hung up the phone and I changed my phone number. <laughs> the only time in the history of me owning phones, which is a long time now. Yeah. But I actually changed my number because of Chris. And, you know, we laughed about it sure after but the reality was i i knew i had the instinct that abwh because i'm a yes man yeah you know what i mean abwh is over there these guys are over here there's nothing but money being thrown around from these labels and managers are thinking about huge tours 
if I get in there and I do what I could have was offered to do in about T minus six months, it's all over and they're going to put this thing back together and they're going to do the super union. You know, I I can see the the wall. (laughs) Excuse me. And quite frankly, I wasn't going to step in front of that train. Yeah, I I get that. I felt that I, that between logic and learning and then world trade and learning, I was starting to figure out the business and I could navigate it and go get another record deal doing something else. You know what I mean? So I just wanted to do my own thing. So fast forward, whatever it was, six months, Chris sends me a message to this, my roommate at the time, who was an engineer friend of mine, Tom Fletcher, and we did tons of work together. And Tom comes into the living room. What did he say? This is going to be, Chris says, this is going to be great. (laughs) No, he says, he says, Billy, Chris just texted me because they, you know, they're called, they had been friends and two by proxy, you know. Yeah. Uh, Chris just called me, man. And and he doesn't want to talk about you being the lead singer, but he doesn't want to talk to you and just say hello. Now, by then I I could see where the the cards were on the table. So had they, had they at that point, was it you changing your number that made them go after Roger Hodgson for 20 minutes? No, that was actually okay. before me. Okay, okay. I, I was kind of the last one in the chain. Okay, because I remember them going to Phoenix and rehearsing with him, and I remember that. So now I have the time context yep. again, okay. The last one in the chain, because right after that, and, and I, I stopped talking to Chris, uh, the next thing I knew, all of a sudden, Chris, you know, through Tom, uh, wants to speak to me, so... I call, or he calls me and we speak and he explains to me exactly what I had predicted and told him was, was going to happen, yeah. which was ABWH and Yes West, as they call it, yeah. are going to merge and they're going to make a record together as the super yes. Right. And I was like, of course you are. <laughs> yeah. Duh, like you didn't know that. <laughs> so, you know, so what else is up? You know what I mean? And he says, well, the thing is, the songs we wrote are kind of in the loop now. And I said, well, which ones? And he said, well, the more we live, the band really likes the more we live and they want to take it to the next level. So could you, would you mind coming into the studio and working with us and and getting it going with us here? So I did, I went down to Cherokee and I worked and uh, recorded, you know, stuff with TK was there and and, um, Alan, you know, and and, uh, of course, Chris. Eddie Offord and myself. That's who the team that was working on it. And um, it was a very funny thing when we were working on The More We Live. I hadn't thought about this in a while, but I had recorded the bass, which is a very simple bass part. You know what I mean? It just, it's, it's not like Silent Wings Freedom. It's very straight ahead. <laughs> so when, it, when, it, when we're in the studio with Eddie, Eddie says to Chris one day, so fishy you, you you need to replay this bass and chris says oh, well, i kind of like what he did there you know what i mean let's, let's leave it for now don't worry about it a couple days later fishy you've got to replay this bass and chris goes you know man I, I i really like what he did just let's leave it and then again you know the next day fishy you gotta it kept fishy again and chris finally says eddie we're going to leave the bass billy played and did Chris decide to change his number to stop hearing that from Eddie? That <laughs> so Eddie wouldn't call him. I'm more patient than I did. Um, <laughs> so we ended up leaving that bass on there, but it was just very funny the, those exchanges because I'm here I am sitting on the couch, like relatively a newbie into the Yes community. Mm-hmm. And I'm watching the producer of several of my favorite records ever telling the bass player who I worship to play it and he don't want to yeah yeah <laughs> you know I mean? it was just a very surreal situation yeah and, um and then of course they they brought you know john anderson in to record and um the vibes were not great it's it's no mystery that that period is with tumultuous you know yeah. things that, and um I'll never forget they're sitting in there with me in the control room and they said John's coming in today I said great let's we'll put this vocal down you know I'm kind of a newbie I don't it's great let's go and they said well you're gonna do it I said cool well you'll be here so we can you know make sure everything's good said, no 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 I said what do you mean no 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 and well we're not gonna be here it's just gonna be you I'm like well you guys should hang it's a, no 
So <laughs> about half an hour before John got there, they all got up and split. I mean, Why? Just vibes, man. You know, it's oh. messed up. Okay. Uh, I've got, I, I, I'm waiting in the room and John comes in and we get the job done. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's and a great is, song, by the way. It's a beautiful song. It's got so much depth. It's great. Yeah. It really is. That's you know, I'm proud, that, I'm proud of that song for multiple reasons. The first one and the most important thing to my heart about that song is it's the first song I ever wrote with Chris. Yeah. Right. And the fact that the lyrics were so positive and um, and the, the idea of the song and what it meant and just, you know, the chordal structure, how it worked. It was just, for me, it was the perfect point of entry with Chris, you know. Yeah, when and you did it again with Conspiracy, right? Do I remember that correctly? You did it again with Conspiracy? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. we put the demo of it on Conspiracy. That's which is right. where we started. Yeah. It was very close to the, what we ended up with, you know, outside yeah. of a couple editions of some other Yes guys. But... um proud that 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 song was the first point of entry because when you're writing songs with people it's a real personal thing yeah and there's either something going on or there isn't and sometimes even when there's something going on you write a song and you're like okay that's a cool song but sometimes you know chris and i both knew there's something unique about what we just did and that concept for both of us was why we wanted to pursue this writing thing together and see what else we could do and and along the way we've written some very amazing pieces if you ask me i mean when i listen to days of wonder you know it kind of gets me because chris is, sounds so amazing on there and his chord structures and then you know there's just yeah. there's a lot there i'm glad we did at the end of the day especially now that we've lost it you know it's just such an amazing thing to be able to have personally so yeah. so anyway the more we live gets etched onto the union album Love Conquers All, which was another song we were working on. Yeah, gets I love that song. Etched onto the Yes Years box set. So, so that's kind of my point of entry in terms of the recording side of things. They, go, of course, go out and do Union. I go to production. I produce Paul Rogers, Muddy Water Blues. And I start producing other records, Motorhead, a bunch of other stuff. And... 1994, they, they're finishing the talk record and Trevor Raven calls and says, how you doing? I said, good, what's up? And he says, well, we're going to tour the talk record and we want to ask you out to come out as a multi-instrumentalist guy and play some bass too, if, you know, if, 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 if it's needed, you know, kind of thing. And I said, of course, yes, I'm down. Yeah. So that was my first point of entry with yes on stage and touring and I, to be honest you know up until that time i was trying desperately to get my bands to the point of touring but it just because of regime change and circumstance it never right. came All right so i went from zero to light speed because it was five star hotels and first class airfare and just it was like wow okay this is how you do it yeah and we played amazing shows all over the place. And I, you know, I was proud to be a part of it. And I saw I you at an amazing venue. How cool is it to play at the Greek? I saw you at the Greek on that tour. Yeah, I mean, the Greek's great because that outdoor vibe, there's nothing like it, especially yeah. on a beautiful- And it's a legendary place. You know, it's like the bowl. It's like the Hollywood Bowl. There's so many places like that. And since that was my first taste of playing those amazing places, you know, the one that sticks out to me was Madison Square Garden with my grandmother in the audience in between songs, just screaming, <laughs> from, the, from the, you know, wherever she was, it was like, that's her. Right. Uh, that was a very special memory. Um, it was really cool. So I tour with the talk record and we, you know, it's no mystery. Yes. Goes through phases and those phases come with emotional stuff that goes on between band members. You cannot sure. help it. Right. So things were not great on the road uh, with the top band, the 90125 lineup, you know, and I was not in the band like legally as a member. I was a side band, but I was close enough to the flame to feel the heat, you know, and it was not always good. If you don't so, mind me asking, was the biggest point of contention mainly between John and Trevor? Um, it's hard to say, but just it just was okay. collapsing and you could feel it. Oh. You know, and it was not bands when they're not cohesive and, and it's not working between the brotherhood of musicianship and all that stuff. It's it's destined. Yeah, to it's like a marriage going bad. I've been through that. 
Yeah. So we do that tour. There's vibes, blah, blah, blah. I get off the plane at LAX and nobody's really talking to anybody as everyone's leaving. There's no real big goodbye. See you later. Except for me, because they're all wishing me goodbye because I did my job, but I wasn't involved with all that. So I'm saying goodbye to everybody, but I'm watching the vibe still just to sort of, and then the next thing I know, <coughs> they're, they're broken up. And the classic lineup is reforming in San Luis Obispo. Right. Where they make, <coughs> excuse me, I've got allergies and Santa Clarita is just rough. Um, where they make the Keys to Ascension 1 record, right? Yeah. And so Keys 1 is recorded and they're trying to mix it and it's not going quite the way they want. So I get a phone call from Chris we're in a pinch. Can you mix this record? It's going to be great. <laughs> and so I, uh, yeah, at that point I'm cool. Cause we've established the boundaries. Um, yeah. I said, sure, man. So they come to my studio where I had a studio here in LA and Van Nuys for the longest time where I'm in a bunch of the office. Things. Yeah. And, and I mix keys one and they're all very happy. And one thing leads to another. And I get a phone call from Chris. Hey, everybody dug your vibe, you know, loved your work would you produce keys too? We're going to make a second follow-up. I said, sure. So they all come to my studio and we record keys too. And it's at that point, and this is where, you know, the yes community might've got a few things wrong because a lot of people think I came in and, and sort of, you know, crushed that idea and, and took over with open your eyes. But what happened? Was, <laughs> really? I, people think that? Yeah. As I was mixing, Keys two. Uh, I was sitting there with Chris and John. I'll never forget. John's on this couch in the back, and the phone rings, and John grabs it, and it's a phone call. And I can I can tell just from where I am looking over at him that he's kind of distressed. And so I stop the tape. He finishes his call. I said, "What's up?" He goes, "Well, Rick just quit." And that was Rick's whatever how many times he's departed Eight. from yes departure at that point. <laughs> So he goes, finish the record and send me the mixes. And so John splits and I'm sitting there with Chris. And it's at that point where I've been around Yes long enough and I've seen so enough heartbreak and whatnot. And it's still like, as it is, I sit here today, my favorite band ever. Yeah. I said to Chris, I cannot have Yes in my studio and it be the last thing that ever happens. It cannot end here. That's not cool. Right, I get that. Something. We have to do something. And and so I said, let's just start writing some things and see what happens. And, and, you know, let's just write. So Chris and I started writing. And we came up with some cool things and started sending tapes around to John. And John wrote back, wow, this, this is cool. I want to sing on this. So he was in Hawaii. So John sings on it. He's done Wonder Love and Love Shine, a few other of those songs. Alan hears it and goes, wow, let me play on it. So Alan comes down and plays on it. And Steve, of course, you know, gets involved and does his thing. And we have this record, but there's no record deal yet. Mm. And there's no manager because it's kind of floating in the abyss as far as like a band goes. Yeah. So Alan Kovacs gets involved, who is a super, still is a, a huge mogul in the business. And someone who I really admire and respect because he's, he's a sharp character. And he signs the band and signs the record. The thing is, it's like, am I in this? Am I a friend? Am I the producer? What, what am I doing? So, <laughs> it kind of went unsaid at first, Billy. Well, it was, it was not known because, you see, I'd played keys on a lot of it, but I'd also played some guitar because... Right. I knew some of the things initially on guitar because, as you said, you know, I'm a multi instrumentalist guy. If I'm feeling something on guitar, I'll start writing it on that. Yeah. So they said, Well, no, you're going to be the keyboard player. And I said, I'm not a keyboard player. And they said, Well, you just did all these keys. I said, Yeah, in the studio where I can punch stuff in, but like I'm not Rick Wakeman level or, you know, mm -hmm. Mraz and, and TK and not know, even I, Billy Sherwood level. I take it to the studio and get the job done, but 
holding all that together live, that's not my forte. And a man's got to know his limitations, as Clint Eastwood once said. You know what I mean? That's smart. Yeah. So, so I said, I'm happy to come out and play rhythm guitar and, and be involved, you know, um, but I'm not playing keys. And so at that point, they kind of said, well, you, you, you're too deeply embedded in this entire project to not be a part of it. So you're in the band. So now I'm officially a band member of Yes. And that leads to us needing the keyboard slot filled. And at that point, you know, John Anderson reaches into his pouch of 4,000 cassettes from keyboard players who want to be the keyboard player in Yes. First, what he pulls out is Igor Gohorshev, who was an extremely gifted keyboard player. Yeah. He came over to uh, my studio and we sat there and he put on, we put on, um, you know, the revealing science of God and he, he played through the whole thing. And so he got that gig. But he was kind of still in that sideband slot in terms of like he just got to the party. You know what I mean? I yeah. had served, I had served for quite a while before it it moved up that level. Yeah. Um, so that's you know, that's how that thing evolved. And so we do the open your eyes record and it does very, very well and and you know, sold quite well and got us touring in big venues again. And uh we carry on and we do the latter. And Bruce Fairbairn produces that one because at that point the guys were like, look, you're in the band now. Just we want you on this side of the glass when we're working. You know what I mean? Kind of thing. Yeah. Producer band. So uh, Bruce produced that record and we went out and toured that one. By the end of that record, you know, I could sense that they were feeling like they wanted to go back to the classic lineup again. It was just a feeling that I had in the same way that I knew to watch the train hit me about union. Yeah. I kind of feel like this thing is, it was great. We did great work, but I, I can sense they want to go out and play close to the edge again as the classic lineup. So I split in 2000 uh, and went into the world of jingles for a couple of years where strangely, the guy who I worked for, his name was Jonathan Elias, produced half of the union record. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that's where we met. Oh. So right around 2000, I was in my hotel room and I, I, you know, after a gig, and I, I called Jonathan. I'm like, hey, can I come work for you? <laughs> <laughs> kind of want to get back home and just stay home for a while. What do you think? So I, I worked at Elias Arts alongside Jimmy Hahn, who worked there, and my brother Mike, and a bunch of other great writer artists. I did that for about two years. And then I started really getting bored of working in 30 second chunks of music. And I wanted to get back to what I do. So I started producing records again and mm -hmm. worked with countless people and, and did, as you know, many, many tributes that, you know, yeah. too, too many to mention. I've lost track. And uh, <laughs> kind of minding my own business, doing that. And as I'm doing those tribute records, I'm establishing connections with people because I'm, I'm hiring and working with so many amazing artists, Steve Hackett, Steve Morris, Steve yeah. Steven, Steve Hillage, all the Steves were covered. <laughs> um, all these amazing keyboard players, you know, Wake, Wakeman, Emerson, all, you know, Steve Wakeman, Steve, Steve Emerson, Steve Shulman. There. And so I had kind of connections with a lot of different artists that I was enjoying being able to work with. And that was, that's why I kept pursuing that. And along that way, I, I made one record that was a tribute to the wall. It was called Back Against the Wall. I remember that. Yeah. And it's at that point that I haven't talked to Tony in a while, but, you know, TK is one of those guys in Yes that that when when we met, we bonded immediately. And it's it, you can't put light through there. It's just it, it we've been buds forever and continue. I just saw him when he was at Rosfest. We went out and had dinner. We have our band circa, as you know, and all that stuff. Yeah. So it's a, it's right around that period. I, I I call Tony out of the blue. I say, Tony, how you been, man? And he's like, good. I said, you, you should play on this record I'm making. I've got all these other keyboard players and you know, have you come in and do some stuff. And he says, oh, man, I'm retired. I'm, I'm just playing tennis. I said, 
No, 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 you're not. You're playing keyboard. I'm coming over. And so I kind of pushed him and pulled him out of that retirement mode that he thought he was in. And he played on the wall tribute. And it was right there that I was like, you know what, man, me and you, we should do some writing just for fun. And so we wrote Brotherhood of Man, Cut the Ties, Information Overload, yeah. all these cool tracks. And Alan had played on the wall record that I did. So when Alan was there, I'd already had all this material going. And I said, you want to hear some stuff I did with Tony K? It's pretty cool. And I played him a few tracks. And Alan goes, I want to be involved. Oh, wow. That's how that came about. That's great. So uh, Alan jumped in. And now it's just a matter of like, who's going to play guitar? And, you know, Jimmy Hahn and I, we've had a relationship through my whole life and continue to, as he's an arc of life, you know, still. And uh, I said, I've got the guy. Jimmy's the perfect guy. So there is how Circa became Circa. Wow. And so, you know, we go forward with Circa. And like, yes, Circa goes through its own revolving door of people. Yeah. And, you know, Jay Shellen joins after Alan leaves because, yes, kind of had a thing where John Anderson left and they got their first tribute singer and they needed to go do that. And Alan couldn't do us. So we got Jay. And then after Jay came Scott Connor, the drummer. After Jimmy left came Johnny Bruins. And then there was one album where I played drums. And then I decided that I wanted to play guitar. So I got Rick Tierney to play bass and Scott Connor was on. It. So it's, it's had its own little, you know, spin cycle, if you will. Yeah. But, um, so those are those years, pretty much. And there's a lot of production work that happens inside there, too. But basically, the reason why I'm shortening that period is because the next link to the, the yes thing comes around, I don't remember if it was 2013 or 12, something around there. They're making the Heaven and Earth record. Mm -hmm. And Steve Howe calls me. Out of the blue, I haven't talked to Steve since I left the band, basically, you know, it's a long time. And he says, hey, man, how are you? I was like, good, it's nice to hear from you. What's going on? And he this says, well, is going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> he says, well, we're making this record, and we want you to come get involved with the background vocal arrangements and sort of produce the backing vocals for us and, and get involved. And I said, I'd love to. So I went to the studio where they were recording and spent 10 days with Chris and John and Steve and myself. And we got this thing sorted out, which is all the vocals that you hear on, on the Heaven and Earth record. So did, did, you, figured, sorry, did you contribute some of those background vocals yourself as well? Or oh, yeah. You... Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. I, I helped arrange, and, you know, for lack of a better word, write the, the, yeah. a lot of the, you know. Harmonies and stuff. Yeah. Um, so what I was going to say is it's interesting for me in my career with yes, because I've come across a few people, you know, there's this, you know, how you, the yes community is for the most part, it's very supportive, warm and loving. And, and that's the part I love. Cause that's yeah. where I, yep. Us too. There are, there are some people who are like, how did you get here? And why are you still here? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what am I Should I just ignore them. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I've always said the same thing, which is true. Is like I never really pursued yes. They always contacted me and kind of right. asked me to do something. And my loyalty to the band is such that it's like when asked, I will serve because that's just yeah. how I this band. So I finished the background vocals and I, and just as I just said, I'm kind of assuming, well, that was fun. That's it. I'll probably never hear from these guys again, or it's gonna be a long time. I go home. Phone rings about a week later. It's like, hey, can you mix this for us? <laughs> <laughs> We have 10 days left and we need to get this mixed. And of like, course. And uh, Squire was funny. He used to call me the fixer, you know, like from Pulp Fiction. He's like, yeah, we need oh, to nice. fix this. <laughs> so I do, I, I, I mix Heaven and Earth and, you know, comes out and they're now out on the road with John Davison, who I think has got just a wonderful voice. And yeah. when I was working with John at the studio, you know, we became friendly instantly because he's just such a cool dude. And, we related on so many different levels and that relationship started, you know, and was just bonded right there too. Um, so they went out and started playing live and I get a call, Hey, we're making a live record. Can you mix it? Sure. 
hey, we're making another live record. Can you mix it? Yeah, we're making another one. I mean, I, I don't remember how many I mixed before the transition, if you will, but it was, it was quite a few. And um, so I'm in this loop now where I'm kind of mixing their records, but I'm in communication with them a lot more. And more importantly, Chris, you know, it kind of reestablished our need to be talking to each other a lot more than you normally would as, hey, man, are you okay? Great. Talk to you soon. We're talking a lot. And so somewhere around 2015, they're getting ready to go out and tour with Toto. I, I forget what the dates were, but um, Chris calls me and says, so we're supposed to go out and do a tour with Toto but I'm kind of sick. And I said, what do you mean kind of sick? Like what kind of sick? And he said, well, I got this thing that I got to have checked out. And you know, it's just not, it's just going to take me out of the loop for a while. It's being kind of coy. And I said, well, you need to, you know, do what you got to do to keep your health in order, obviously. So I guess you'll have to postpone the tour because you can't tour yes without you. You know what I mean? So, um, Tell the guys in the band, you're going to need some time and get it done. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, well, I'll talk to you tomorrow, you know, like he always would. And 10 minutes later, I get a phone call from his wife, Scotty. And she says, he's not being honest with you in terms of what's going on here. And I need to tell you, he just didn't want to tell you. But you need to know, he's got this real serious case of leukemia. And it's coming on strong. And he's in trouble. Now, which that just set me back. It was like oh, the most mind blowing phone call I've had since your, your, your dad just died, which was, you know, yeah. back when I was a kid. Chris was that figure for me of like, you know, not like a father, but like a, an older brother to me at this point. Right. And so I'm kind of blown away. And so the next day, Chris calls and he goes, So she told you what's going on. And I said, Yeah, man. But look, I know people personally who have had this, you know, and have beaten it. It's not easy, but they beat it. So you'll be fine. You know what I mean? You get in the hospital and you get the treatments that you need and you'll be fine. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, I'm just kind of bummed out, you know, that, that, that yes, can't do this tour because there's, there's so much responsibility on the line in terms, this is where his head was at as he's just being diagnosed with this thing. He's thinking, the crew and their family, you know, they're not going to have an income. The guys, Toto had this plan. You know, he's kind of thinking of everybody else. I brought him back to the center and said, look, you need to get in there and get healed. So you need to tell the band they're going to have to wait. And he goes, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll talk to you tomorrow. So he calls me the next day when he says, again, I just, you know, I'm so bummed that, that this thing has to stop because, you know, it's, I, and I, I said, Chris, did you call them? And he goes, well, not yet. I'm like, well, do me a favor. When you hang up with me, call them and tell them. He goes, yeah, 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 yeah. So calls me the next day. He goes, same thing. I'm just so bummed that, you know, I said, Chris, did you call him? He goes, you're not getting it, are you? And I said, getting what? And he goes, I, I want you to step in for me and do this. And I want it to happen. And I said, no, I, I did not get that. Because to be honest with you, as many ways as I've ended up in Yes, which are unique. I mean, I'm playing Shaker and the talk to her at some point. You know? <laughs> I never expected to replace Chris Squire. It was never, right. ever. You yeah. know, Chris was going to be the last man standing like Keith Richards. You know what I mean? Yeah. It never occurred to me. So. How'd you digest that, that? that? Well, that kind of blew my mind for a minute and it was pretty emotional. And, you know, I was, I kind of lost a little bit and, you know, I'm hearing my hero asking me to do this, which is an amazing honor. But by the same token, why is he asking me? Because he's in some dear, deep, deep trouble here. You know, it was just, yeah. it was reality on a level that I wasn't used to. And it was hard. It was, really and was, hard. was it a unexpected, I mean, obviously for, probably obvious reasons it was welcome but at the same time was it as much of a burden to fill that role and well, live up to expectations just all the things i don't even need to say you know what i mean intimidating as hell you know yeah. what i mean on the face but 
there's no way I was going to deny him this wish. Yeah. So I said, yeah, I will do that. But there's, but I need you to go out and make a statement that we are going to do this. And I need you to tell people you're going to come back because you are going to come back. Okay. So I'm standing in for you. I'm not replacing you. And he's like, yeah, I will do that. I will do that. So he put out a press statement that went out to the public and yeah. said something to that effect. So now I'm rehearsing and I'm at home and he's calling me every day. How's it going? I'm like, that's, it's weird, but it's good. How are you? You know what I mean? Are you okay? I am dealing with the treatments and this, that, and the other. And I'm like, he was like, do you need anything? I said, not really. And he, he, he says, uh, I said, you know, there's something that's kind of on, on my mind. I want to run by you. And, you know, how do you feel about this? But you know, I said, Chris, you know, I've never played a Rickenbacker. It's just never been my thing ergonomically. He goes, don't even consider it. That would be ridiculous if you did that. Don't, don't even worry about it. You have your own thing. That's why I want you to do this. You have your own thing. So play the instruments you want to. I said, great, because I know that's going to be coming at me right out of the gate. Why isn't he standing there? <laughs> All right. right. If I have your personal endorsement on and being out and without it, it's okay. I, I feel better about things already, you know? Yeah. So, <laughs> so I start rehearsing and as as i'm at home shedding you know and this is a real compressed period of time this isn't a lot of time uh and he keeps calling and then conversations are turning to like i'm not gonna make it he says Ugh. and i said you know chris i don't really want to hear this you you know don't give up this fight I, i've known people who've survived this you are going to make it. No, no, man, I, I don't think I'm going to make it, you know? And I was like, this is hard to hear and I don't want to hear it. Just keep yourself positive and we talk about anything else. And then the next day he called me, he goes, I'm telling you, I'm not going to make it and I need you to accept that and I need you to hear something. And I was like, what's that? And he's like, I want yes to continue. I want you to go for it. And there were other things said that are kind of personal, but it, you get the gist right. of what I'm saying. Yeah. And, and his, you know, in this, which was mind blowing again, because in this moment of extreme grief and I'm sure terror in his heart, because I mean, he's facing what he was facing, yeah. he still thinks about yes. And, it, you know, this idea of yes, and that he was all about that and wanted it to continue, you know, how many icons you know pass the keys over to someone else and say keep this car going you know what i mean right. so it was just an intense period and i was trying to process it as best i could and sort of maintain and he's like so you know promise me you're going to keep doing this and i said yes and i promise you but you are coming back but you know i promise you if it makes you feel better but you're coming back you know what i mean then I didn't really get any more phone calls and it was about three days or so, four days. And I knew something had taken a turn. And this cloudy Sunday morning, I get up and go take a walk out in the back of my place where I lived at the time. I had the wide open desert spaces behind me and I would go out there and take a walk. It's like six in the morning, I'm watching the sun come up. Come back, grab my bass to start playing some of the yes stuff that we're about to go out and do really quickly after, you know, a week or two, whatever it was. And I open my email to check things and I just see a message from the manager that says, Chris. And I knew what it was. And I sat there and, you know. Sorry. It's, it's, it's very I, heavy, understandable. I couldn't open it. Mm. So oh after God. after time, I opened it, and you know, life is the way it is when we lose people. So from that moment forward, you know, I just took it as a as a personal. like mission to keep this thing going right yeah you know and it it bothers me when i hear people tell me to stop sure 
Yeah. And, you know, it makes me more defiant and dig my heels in and want to keep it going. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I think it's known out there in the community that that's how I am and that's how I react. And, you know, I don't interact with the people on Facebook when they start getting into tangles over this, that, and the other, you know. But when, when, when I see it and it's coming directly at me and it's, or I see someone saying they should have stopped when Chris Squire died. It pisses me off because of what I just told you was in Chris's heart. Yeah. yeah they it was don't that, so I, I understand that and kind of give them a little room, but if they carry on, I have to, I, sometimes I just go in and explain to them what the reality of the situation is. So, so here we are. I'm, I'm hoping, I just no. want to say, I'm, I'm hoping that there's people like that out there that will see this and can learn a little bit more and be a little more sensitive and understanding, you know, whether they like it or not, they can have a different perspective of it. And yeah. to me, I think that's important. You know, there's yeah. people out there that say yes isn't yes without Patrick Morass. There's everybody, there's every fucking story and every perspective we could possibly imagine. Yeah. And I'm hoping that your story of what really happened and how it happened will kind of enlighten some people and also get them to lighten up. Yeah. Well, and you know, my theory too is that those who believe in yes want it to go forward. And those are the people that I'm doing it for. And those are the yeah. people Chris is talking about doing yeah. it. Yeah. 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 And you're doing a great job, by the way. You you have in all these different roles. And I, I'm not kissing ass. How many times did I tell you since 1998 when we first met how much I just loved Fortune Seller and the production of that whole album? You know, I've been on your ass about that stuff for how long has it been? 30 years or whatever? Yeah, what I year mean, is this? I don't even yeah, know anymore. But, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the best I can. I... I I feel better about the work that I'm doing now. I was, when, when I did that first tour after Chris passed and we were playing live, it was very difficult, you know, going out there and playing and looking out at an audience that I knew was looking at an absence and a change. And it was like, you know, I said to the band, if, if this doesn't work, this is all going to be my fault. <laughs> so I'm going to do the best I can here and try to make this work. And, and I think, the fans, you know, were, were such an important component of me wanting to carry on and also giving me that strength to find that defiance to keep going, you know, um, yeah. because of their warmth and their, their, the way that they embraced me. But I, I also think that comes from the fact that they, you know, I wasn't a stranger to a lot of these people. And they also knew my relationship with Chris in Yes, in Conspiracy, you know, in Life. So it kind of made sense to a lot of people, but the fans definitely made it easier. And, uh, you know, that first tour was really rough. Things got a little bit easier after that, but now there's a lot of time that's passed and, and I'm comfortable in the role. And, and I, I'm now, I've played actually as the bass player of Yes on a studio album and we're working on another one. Yeah. And so my imprint is, is being embedded into the legacy in that way. And, you know, we go forward and I have to go forward being me, but honoring Chris as best I can, which is what I try to do every time I play one of his things, you know, and I will play various things of his that have me laughing on stage because I remember how he would laugh when he'd play it. And then yeah. there's other moments that I'll play a particular passage and out of the blue, it just strikes me and I just have to put my head down because I'm just totally sad about the fact that he's not here because this such a beautiful thing he wrote here and he should be playing it you know so yeah life is not fair in that way i mean i lost my brother in november of, of 19 and you know he died way too young and so did chris and these these things are just part of of life and and they give you the wisdom and the, you know hopefully you find the strength to yeah to figure it out forward, you know? absolutely and, thanks for sharing it's yeah. almost eight. It's almost eight years later now that I've, I've been doing this, which is shocking, but most fans know. don't even last eight years. I mean, I know. you know, yeah. I mean, and, and unfortunately the last three have been completely stolen by this COVID thing, but you know, it's still the, 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 punch, the time card's still being punched. Yeah. You know? 
<laughs> and, yeah. and I don't know if you remember or saw it. I'm, I think I sent it to you. You know, we did a special, Stephen and I, on Michael on his birthday. Oh, wow. That's sweet. Yeah. yeah. And I remember back in, this is around the time Steve was born, because I remember where I was living in Ventura. And I had reached out to you and invited you to go. I don't know if you remember this. I invited you to go with me down to San Diego to see Roger Waters. And you weren't available, but you said, you know what? Maybe my brother Michael would want to go. Do you want his phone number? Oh. And I called Michael and he appreciated it, but wasn't available. But uh, we got to talk a bit and everything. I, I ended yeah. up taking my mother. <laughs> I took my mom okay. lived in West Hills. I was in Ventura. We drove down to San Diego. My mom pumping her fist to Roger Waters. And on the way back, we're on the 405. And she says to me, and it's like one in the morning or two, whatever. And she says, Danny, are you speeding? I look down, I go, I'm like five over. She says, what's with all the cops? And I look in the mirror and it's nothing but blue and red across all lanes of the 405 going north. And I'm like, I don't know, but I'll slow down and start to pull over. And as I did, they all got off and I realized, wait a minute, Staples Center, the Lakers just won the championship. People are freaking out. And that's what that was. Wow. <laughs> so I, that all, like when I think of Michael, I think of all that. It's so weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing all that. You know, I know that was hard. Well, yeah. Yeah. And, and I'd also like to read um, three comments we have before we sort of wind down with a couple other questions, if that's all right. Yeah, go for it. So Christina from earlier said, I've been a Yes fan for 30 years and you have always been a welcome addition to Yes. Oh, that's very yeah. sweet. Thank you very much. She loves your work on Close to the Edge. I'm no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I actually had a guy to meet and greet once say that to me. He goes, I love your work on Close to the Edge. I said, no, no, I, I wasn't on Close to the Edge. <laughs> yeah, you were. I said, yeah, I was. <laughs> I mean, what, what's funny is this other comment. Um, oh, were you like seven when that came out? Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Kevin. I was, a, I, I was on a big wheel when they were working on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Kevin McIvergan says, has anyone ever told you that you and Chris sound alike vocally? And, and he also says, amazing Billy, respect. Um, uh, and Mil well, Surratt says, saw Billy with Yes early 2000 badass so like you know high praise right there yeah your voices went so well together really well yeah chris and i you the know timber probably because i i sort of sang along with fish out of water so many times trying to get that phrasing you know yeah. I, I sort of uh, morphed into some of that quality but and i can I, admittedly i know i can do a pretty good chris if i'm in the studio you know what i'm I mean? sure yeah uh, but uh it's funny because a lot of people when I was younger said I sounded like John Anderson. Interesting. Uh, of course, I'm a lot older now and, you know, I don't sing as high as I once did when I was 20. But back in the day, you know, it was always like, wow, you sound like John. It, I always used to get John Anderson, a mixture of John Sting and Chris. So Interesting. we joke in logic that I was John Andersting. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. When Sting, when the police first came out, the first thing I thought of was that guy is trying to sound just like Chris Squire. Exactly. And, and he still does. That's why I dug it so much. You yeah. Know I mean? Yeah, that was a part of it. But yeah, Chris and I uh, kind of had that same timber. And, you know, we knew it too as we were working together. Yeah. You know, that, that was a thing we could work on. And I had the same thing with Mike, obviously, but that was more of genetic. But yeah, it was, yeah. It was just, you know, kinds of ways he phrases vowels and syllables. I was sort of into that same mode and and you know i've never sung with a fake english accent but it just starts getting into that shape. the enunciation and everything yeah it's, that, it's the feeling in that shape you know yeah um before we go into a very quick rapid fire of fun fact questions for you we'll be real quick with that can you tell us anything about the new album um you know i really can't because Steve's okay. producer, and you would be getting me into a lot of trouble that's okay. Can we keep us in mind for when you can? I have a great relationship with Steve, so I'm not going to do anything to jeopardize. That. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I was also totally wondering, and, and like, I don't know if you're allowed to say anything, but I was also wondering, like, 
how much of the quest we might expect on any of these upcoming tours. But again, I don't know like how much you're about to say, which is totally well, fine. You know, that's the other thing is, you know, Steve's very precious about the set list and keeping it as top secret as possible in a world right. where leaks are just inevitable. So I, I don't want to be the source of that. We're at a yeah. band meeting. Hey, <laughs> after the first show, it's like the whole world knows. Yeah. <laughs> but cool. So let's go into... Uh, Steve's going to kick off rapid fire fun fact questions and then I'll tie it all up and, and folks thanks for watching and thank you again Billy so Steve it's all yours when you're done I'll add a couple and we're out okay. all right so what is your favorite Seinfeld episode oh my god um, Kramer getting the lattes for the rest of it <laughs> and the last scene where he's at the door explaining to the guy you know he's, <laughs> just if I can relate to that, you know what I mean? I'm a huge, as you see, it's like I've got my triple vente. Right, you know, right. Nice. Uh, you know, I could relate totally to his Coffee Jones. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what? who is your favorite Curb Your Enthusiasm side character? Um, what is his roommate's name? Um, oh. Um... Leon. Yeah, Leon. Yeah, uh, I was about to say the name of his character from a different show, but yeah, you, you got Leon it. So. Is, Leon is the best. I mean, the funniest things that he says, I can't repeat here to the general public. <laughs> right. I mean, he does feel like the Kramer of Curb, weirdly. Yeah, he is, but it's, you know, Curb is like Seinfeld X rated. Yeah. You know? it is, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but Leon. Uncensored. Is, yeah. I love Leon. He's, he's one of my favorite characters. Okay. Great. Yeah. Do you have more, Steve? Uh, no. Oh, go ahead okay. with yours. I, I got a few. Billy, I got to ask. By any chance, are you in a white car? Uh, I am not, but you can see I'm surrounded by the... Uh, by the light. The, the glow. Of That's that. Chris. I'm a man in a glowing white car. <laughs> Great. You've been all over the world. Where? What's a destination other than my house up in Globe, Arizona? What's a destination you've never been to that you would love to go to, and why? Wow. Well, maybe Israel. You know, at some point. Oh uh, yeah. Go see the, the the history of it all, and yeah, you know, the of it all. And I've I've never made it over there. It's kind of a uh, you know, it's like obviously at times a global hotspot. So I, yeah, that's uh, why I've never made it there. Not one of our stops. I wish it kind of was. Yeah, so not. So yeah, Israel would probably cool. be it. My phone just told me I've got ten percent left here. So. Okay, and where do you have on your itinerary when you tour that when you see it, you look forward to it because of the food? Mm, that's an interesting question. Um, well, New York is always great, you know, because there's just so many amazing places there. Um, and actually, you know, Argentina mm. for the books down there and Brazil for those, those I don't even want to say the word because I'm going to get it so wrong, but there's places where you go in and they, they slice off all the uh, beef at your table. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> over... Oh, there was a place in Henderson my dad and I went to once on North Horizon Ridge Parkway where I lived. I can't think of the name of the restaurant, but that was amazing. That was great. Really good. Yeah. So cool. those, those kind of destinations I like. Well, of course, Japan, because, you know, it's authentic over there. Yeah. Best yeah. food I've ever had, definitely. Okay. What, what would be a Yes song? that you've never played on stage with Yes that you'd love to play? Um, Other than Mood for a Day. <laughs> that's the more we live now that we've discussed it. What's that? Maybe the more we live. I oh, now that, we've that, it. that would be amazing. We yeah. That. yeah. Yeah. That'd be a great homage to Chris as well. Yeah, it would. It would indeed. Yeah, yeah. great. Favorite movie? Well, in a pinch, it's always the first Star Wars, but I have so many favorite movies. Mm. A huge sci-fi freak. Um, cool. To me, sci-fi is is like the visual version of progressive rock music. You know, it's yeah, just, yeah. Uh, it's just a place to experiment and let go. So I have so many favorite movies that I could watch, and I do. My, you know, uh, I sit on the couch, and, and if something, if the Fifth Element starts, I, I, I 
Our <laughs> best thought until it's over. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Great. Last question. When you're not doing anything related to music or work, what do you like to do? Do you have a hobby? Do you collect anything? Or Oculus Quest 2. Really? Oh, wow. Yeah. And I go into VR and I've got some of my favorite games in there. And I and actually, I'm, I'm, I've been a video gamer my whole life going, you know, I started at Pong, shoving quarters into the Pong. <laughs> yeah. So I've been with the evolution of that media for- I go back to pachinko machines. And so I've, I've watched the evolution of how things evolved into, you know, when I had my first Tandy TRS-80 and played yeah. on there to- you know, Nintendo to Xbox. And so finally we've got it where you put it on and you're in this world and you're 3D and you're interacting with other people who are standing there next to you with their avatars. And uh, I don't know, when I'm, when I'm not working on music, I like to go in there and just detach and, and, and not hear music because I do work yeah. on music much, you know what I mean? So yeah. I like, I like the VR world. Nice. Billy, thank you so much again for not only thank joining you. us, but unfolding all that, unpacking all that, some really deep personal things. We really appreciate it. And folks, thank you for following what we do. If you're watching the archive, go ahead and comment. If you're listening to us at anchor.fm slash yes shift, go ahead and share the podcast around. And uh, folks, you can write us love mail, hate mail, suggestions, anything at yes shift podcast at gmail.com. And Billy, hang on the line after we disconnect from the live stream. Will do. Great, thanks. Steve, thanks for joining us, Billy and I. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was a great time, like just all of it. Yeah, thanks again, Billy, we really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me and thanks to everybody out there for this constant support. And you know, it's, it's very much felt and appreciated here. So thank you. Great, thanks for carrying the torch. Yeah, man, honored. Bye, everybody.